All right. How, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the 10 simple ways to, to help wildlife in your backyard. Uh, it's kind of a good uh, thing to talk about in this month as we're all getting ready for gardens and warming up. Wildlife is starting to reappear from either hibernation or migration. And we're all starting to plan our gardens out in our backyards. Uh, my name is John Pulpeter. I'm one of the lead naturalists here at the Woodlands Nature Station. I've been here for about 25 years. And on behalf of the USDA Forest Service, the Friends of Land Between Lakes and the Woodlands Nature Station, I'd like to welcome you. I hope during this program, I'm able to give you some good ideas on some things that you can do in your own habitat, your own places that, that you live, on how you can live a little bit more in a community with the wildlife around you. So as we go along, if you have any questions, you're welcome to, to ask them. Uh, my uh, assistant here, Shannon, will try to answer them as best we can. She's going to also help me with some of our live guests. Uh, I brought a few live animals that you could also find in your backyard. So let's let us just begin. By the way, one thing about me is that I'm a blind person and I am not very computer literate. So there we go. Uh, when I started here, uh, when I started my career in conservation, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to save the rainforest, save the whales, save the tigers, the polar bears, the rhinos, and elephants. I was really focused on those bigger things. And all those big things need a lot of help. They need all of us to be able to participate, to be able to keep those species around. But as I got more and more into my career and I started making observations on my own and starting hearing the information come through, I was finding that there was a lot of conservation need in our own backyard. Uh, we've probably all heard about the plight of bees or the monarch butterfly, how they're disappearing and not being able to make their migration. How about how many people have heard that we're losing a lot of our frogs uh, to a fungus or our bats? I personally have witnessed this in 2012 where the bats in our bat box at the Woodlands Nature Station disappeared from about 500 to 600 bats to maybe a couple dozen, all due to an invasive fungus from Europe. And it killed, almost killed three to eight million bats all throughout the United States. These things are important to us because one little brown bat, the one, the bats that got hit the most, eat a thousand mosquitoes per hour. So these are things that, that really directly impact us humans uh, living here, uh, particularly in the Eastern United States. You know, and, and, and the new battleground for conservation is not you may necessarily Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon or the National Forest, though there are some things that we need to work on there, but they are all in our backyard. 85% of the United States is privately owned. That means each individual landowner can make a big difference in being able to conserve wildlife, to be able to help wildlife, and to make our lives a little bit better. Now, when you guys when I'm talking about wildlife, a lot of times you get, generally have some good ideas of things you've seen on what you could do. Maybe you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, you get some ideas of some nest boxes, some different kinds of bird seed that you can bring into your yard. And all those things are good. Those help individual species. But I'm going to kind of take a different approach during this program. I'm going to be talking about the increase, about the increase, the amount of biodiversity that we have in our backyards. And and particularly the amount of insects and native plants that we have. These are the two largest components. We are going to be building a food well. We're not just going to create habitat of food, water, shelter, and a place to raise your young. We're going to try to create from the, the ground up in this program exactly what you need to do to increase the amount of birds that you have in your backyard, mammals, the amount of reptiles, amphibians, amount of butterflies, and the amount of flowers that you have. We all need the food, water, shelter, and a place to raise our young, but we're going to try to build that food web from the beginning. Because let me give you one statistic that I find kind of uh, important. I'm a particularly uh, big into birds, and uh, we're all familiar with the Carolina chickadee. They often come to our little bird feeder, and one of the ways that we often think about attracting those uh, little birds is by having a black oil sunflower seed for, in a feeder. But that only helps them during a certain time of year. That only helps them during the winter months when they need to build up that fat and they're, building, they're burning off a lot of that energy trying to fight off the cold, being such a small animal. But the majority of its year, particularly when it's raising its young, 
it needs to be able to eat a lot of insects. In particular, the most important insects that you can have in your backyard are those that have caterpillars, the fat little protein rich caterpillars that butterflies and moths have. About 2,200 butterflies and moths live in the state of Kentucky and Tennessee. And these little guys provide most of the food for 95% of the birds that we have in our backyard. So that little chickadee, that Carolina chickadee that we love to see at our feeders, they need six to 9,000 caterpillars per year or per clutch to raise a whole clutch of maybe two to three baby birds. Six to 9,000 caterpillars in your yard to be able to raise that, just that one clutch. And a chickadee will have two or three clutches in a year. So that kind of tells you where we need to go with this. We need to be able to increase the amount of butterflies and moths and we used to have here to be able to increase the amount of wildlife that we have in our backyard. So the 10 simple ways are some different ways that we can increase that biodiversity and make our yard a little bit more of a wildlife sanctuary and wildlife refuge in our backyard. So the number one thing that, and the best thing that you could do, of course, is if you can leave part of your yard, your backyard, your front yard, maybe a wood lot, leave it a little bit wild. And I'm not saying that you can't kind of clean it up a little bit, but if you could just leave 10 or 25% of your property in a wild state where the leaves are on the ground, uh, the dirt is pretty uncompacted, uh, there's a lot of brush and, and the trees, you know, might, some of the trees might be dead, some of them might be alive, you can increase the amount of wildlife that you have in your backyard or keep that wildlife in your backyard. A couple things that I always recommend when uh, we're looking at some of this stuff. Uh, so I started doing this in my yard. This is what we do at the nature station. During the winter months, we leave the leaves on the flower beds. This allows a lot of those insects, uh, both butterflies and moths, but also other insects, beneficial insects, to have a place where they can keep warm. It also protects a lot of the other wildlife that we want to have around, such as some of the lizards. It will help protect, um, allow some of the birds to be able to feed in those areas. Maybe they can keep warm. We also allow a lot of our gardens to kind of maintain their stems up until about spring before we clean them out. A lot of those stems may contain different kinds of beneficial insects in them that the birds might eat throughout that, that winter months or the insects when they hatch out in the spring are ready to go to feed not only the, the birds but also to repopulate uh, the, their insect numbers. And the last thing that I always like to try to encourage when it kind of says leaves it wild is that 75% of the caterpillars that those birds eat, those wildlife eat, that are in those trees they will drop from those trees in the fall into the ground. Now, if you have a, a lawn and that soil is compacted, it's hard. It's very difficult for those caterpillars to be able to survive. They need to be able to bury themselves into the soil. So one of the things that we're recommending nowadays is to maybe have uh, a garden underneath your tree or you leave some of the leaves underneath your tree so it has a little bit more softer soil, some less compacted soil. Uh, so that you have a healthy population of insects once you come out in spring. And those birds that everybody seems to like, or the, the reptiles and amphibians like, your frogs, your tree frogs, uh, they have something to be able to eat and populate uh, with some fresh new butterflies when we come out in the spring. The other most important thing that I could say in this is that we need to encourage everybody to plant natives. Natives are a little harder to come by. You can find a few at Lowe's. You can find some at Home Depot. You can find some at local nurseries, but it, what you need to do is be able to contact your local nature center and be able to find out exactly what is native in your area, whether you're in Kentucky, Tennessee, or in any of the surrounding states. See, each one of these plants, native or non-native, have chemical defenses. And it all depends on how those insects have developed or evolved or adapted to living with those individual plants. Plants from China, plants from India or Australia that get planted in our yards, a lot of times the reason landscapers like those in their yards is because they don't get a lot of insect damage, but they don't provide any ecological services for the wildlife. So the important thing is to try to get some native plants in there. Plus, if you want to have native butterflies or hummingbirds in your yard, the native pollinators, they have to have the plants that they're accustomed to, the plants that they have evolved with, they've adapted to, that provide them the food that they need and do not provide them a particular toxin that they cannot digest. You know, it, about 95 or 5% of the trees that you know, that are native 
can be actually planted in your yard as a super generous. So it encourages the, the majority of your insects. You don't always have to have just as wide diversity of different kinds of plants. You can have some different selected plants that are very productive in being able to attract wildlife. One of the ones I always like to focus on are oak trees. Oak trees attract about 573 different butterflies and moths and caterpillars, and that provides a lot of food. So having one white oak or one red oak in your yard can be quite a big help. And it's a plant that a lot of people like to have in their backyard. Plus, an oak tree provides a lot of nuts um, for, the, for the squirrels and the chipmunks and the blue jays and the redhead woodpeckers to be able to eat. So it provides a lot of a food source for them as well, as, uh, including also your flying squirrels. Um, about 5% of the, these super generous trees and bushes and wildflowers can provide uh, the majority of 75% of all the food that those birds need. And about 95% of the other plants may only serve about 25% of those caterpillars. So you can make some good selections like the oaks, the wild cherries, the willows, the golden rods, the sunflowers, that can be highly productive in your yard and still be something simple to have in your yard that won't take away the aesthetic value. Um, another big thing that I'm always focused on is reducing lawn. Uh, this mainly comes back from my childhood where my mom and my dad have two acres of just mowed lawn. They don't have anything else that's there. They, their original reason was to have places for us kids to be able to run around and play. And that's an important factor. Kids need to be able to go outside and have a good safe space that they can run and play and without them getting hurt. But if that is not a big focus of what you want your lawn to look like, then the best thing to do if you want to attract wildlife, of course, is reduce that lawn. Now, I got two pictures here and I want you to look at each picture. And I want you to think to yourself, which one, am, count how many species on, that you could find. What's that? Oh, there's just one picture. Oh, sorry. Um, the which one is it? The lawn. The big empty lawn. Okay, so take a look at this big empty lawn. I'm sorry, we're having some computer issue, but the the lawn there. Count. Think of how many different kinds of wildlife species can live on that particular lawn. I can only think of a couple. I can think of maybe a Japanese beetle in the grubs. I think of maybe some night crawlers living on the ground, maybe a robin to eat those night crawlers, and maybe a mole, but that's about it. And even those, the robin and the mole, still need to have some shelter from the woods to be able to survive there. That is virtually a green desert. It creates no habitat for anything. Uh, and even us do not like to be out in the middle of that because there's no shade for us. About, unfortunately, here in the United States, the land use, the green lawn is the number one cash crop that we have all throughout the United States. About the size of New England is how much lawn you'll find in the United States. That is an, ex an immense amount. All right, another important one, and this is the one I always like, but you got to kind of be kind of careful, is safely leave a snag or a hollow log. This can be an important feature for a lot of larger wildlife. You know, if you leave a snag, it's going to have a lot of homes for things like your woodpeckers, a lot of squirrels. Uh, it's going to have places for your bats. A lot of times, there's a lot of trees that have what we call sloughing bark. And this is like your shagbark hickories, your sycamores, and your oaks. These are important trees that you can have in your yard that provide a lot of habitat for wildlife, places for them to kind of get out of the weather. They may even be, be even there to hibernate. Hollow logs provide a lot more space for things like, you know, maybe your fox, a groundhog, a rabbit, um, a possum, uh, places for them to be, up, be able to survive out of the weather. And if you, can, if you can afford to leave them, I think you'll get the rewards of being able to enjoy them. Now, what we're going to do next is my assistant is going to switch my camera so that we can show one of our first guests, and it happens to be my favorite guest, because it's my, one of my favorite animals. And it's the most common squirrel that, that we have here in Kentucky and Tennessee. It's called a flying squirrel, southern flying squirrel. They, they only weigh a few ounces, but these little guys can actually glide, they don't actually fly, 
300 feet. And while they're in the gliding, they can actually do a 180 turn with their flat tail. It's pretty amazing the capabilities that they have being able to do that. These guys are the most common because they're nocturnal. You don't often see them, and they'll live in the cavities of those snags. You can even build nest boxes that will attract them. Just like your daytime squirrel, these guys are going to eat your, your seeds, your nuts, your berries, but they also eat bird eggs. They might eat baby birds in some cases. They're going to eat leaves. Uh, but they're a very common squirrel that you're going to find. You can actually attract them to your yard if you put up bird feeders near a wood line or a bluebird box near a wood line. They will actually nest in there. And if you put a red light bulb in your porch light and turn it on, you might be able to see them glide into your feeder. I had several of these come to a suet feeder that I had on an oak tree. And every night I would hear them scampering around and fighting with each other just to get the best um, bit of the suet. If you look at him, he's got big black eyes that helps him see. He's got a flat tail that helps him rudder. And he's got these big patagiums or skin flaps that help him parachute from one tree to the other. Can they see? Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to let him go, put away, give it to my assistant. Number five. All right. So, you know, we talk about, so we're talking about some single species in here. Um, and that, those are important. But these things, these habitat enhancements can actually encourage quite a bit. Just like the snags help bats and woodpeckers and flying squirrels. So the next one is kind of similar in that, in that you can add a brush pile. If you have a lot of sticks that are on the ground, go ahead and throw them in, into a large pile. Uh, a lot of times that will encourage not only reptiles and amphibians, but several different kind of beneficial insects that you want to have around your yard. I also like it because it allows a place for things like nesting birds to have a place uh, to be. So morning doves, quail, I've had even wild turkeys in some of my brush piles uh, nesting. Uh, cocktail rabbits often will be found in there. Uh, so it can be kind of a good home for a lot of those species. Rock piles are another way that you can uh, encourage them out a lot, a lot of wildlife. Those rock piles, I would recommend that you put those in a more of a sunny location uh, so that those rocks can absorb some of that sunlight, especially in the early mornings, and you can encourage a lot more wildlife, that, uh, particularly the reptile and amphibian wildlife, that they'll use it as a basking spot. So, you know, if you want fence lizards or little skinks, uh, that often the skinks like to eat wasps, but if you don't like to have wasps around your yard, you can always have skinks near them. Also, this is a good place that you can find chipmunks and groundhogs. So if you're worried about groundhogs uh, kind of getting too close to your house or your garden, by putting a rock pile towards the very back, you might encourage them more to go towards those locations. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get uh, my, and my next guest. My assistant will help me here. Get your screens up and ready to go. I like to show you one of my favorite snakes that we have. And this particular animal is what we call a king snake, a common or black king snake. These particular snakes are the safest snakes that you're going to have in your yard. They're non poisonous, but they do, or non venomous, but they do eat a lot of the things that we don't like to have in, the, in your yard. Just like the lion's king of the beasts because he eats all the other beasts, this is king of the snakes because he eats all the other snakes. This one eats rats, mice, bugs, spiders, and venomous snakes. I've seen it eat a rattlesnake before. It took two hours for one of these guys to do it, but it was able to do it. It is immune to the venom or partially immune to it. Uh, now, one of the easiest ways to tell them apart from other snakes is that they're black on top, polka dots on the side, checkerboard on the bottom. And even the wild ones, this one's pretty docile. <clears throat> even the wild ones are very docile. They're very uh, calm around people and kids. They, I, you know, anytime I wouldn't recommend you pick them up because a snake's going to defend itself in the best way that it knows how against humans. In some cases, snakes will bite you like a rattlesnake. But in the cases of most non-venom snakes, they have a better strategy in defending themselves against a person. And that is they'll poop on you. And I can't think of anything that will scare a person away more than when something starts pooping on them. And so this one, if you were to harass it, would probably first try to get away. But then if you were to pick it up, it would probably go to the bathroom on you. And that's not what we want. One of the other ways to tell them apart from the venomous snakes 
is by the shape of their head. Their shape of their head is the shape of my thumb, and they have eyes that are rounded, whereas venomous snakes have ones that are more like cat eyes. And a lot of times we're not going to get too close to a snake that tell what shape the eyes are, but the, what the cat eye does is it tells you that it's active during the night, where this one can be active during the day or the night. So these guys are good to have. Basically, any black snakes that you have in the yard are good snakes. They're the ones that keep the venomous snakes, like copperheads, which is the most common one found in backyards, away from anywhere that you want it. Even the smell of the snake is strong enough to be able to be a deterrent to keep those other guys away. So I'm going to put him away. Remember, he's black on top, polka dots on the side, checkerboard on the bottom. But this is one that can be attracted to your... Um, to your, your, your backyard through a rock pile. And one of the advantages to this one, before I mention it, is our garden coordinator is desperately looking for one of these. And the reason why she's desperately looking for one of these is because we're having a lot of problems right now with another native animal called a pine vole, which dig the little holes and you know take out our little plants. And when these guys start showing up in the spring, we don't usually see the signs of the pine vole. So they protect a lot of our plants from some of these um, rodents that can be quite uh, hazardous to our little plants. All right. Next slide is up. All right. So, you know, of course, I think this is one that a lot of people kind of understand because of, of the monarch situation. A lot of people are familiar with that monarchs uh, need milkweed. That is their larval host. The only plant that a monarch will lay its eggs on and it's raised its young is on a milkweed. So milkweeds can be probably one of the most important plants that you can put into your yard. But one of the bad things about milkweeds is that they're toxic to a lot of other species. So they don't really benefit a lot of other things. I particularly like to put a lot of milkweeds in there because I like monarchs. I like to help them. But I also like to put a lot of different kinds of milkweeds in there in your yard that can maybe be dual purpose. So a milkweed, like a butterfly milkweed or a swamp milkweed can be food sources, a like a pollen source or a nectar source for hummingbirds or for native bees or for some of the larger long tongued butterflies like some of the swallowtails. Um, of course, any kind of plant that once you do some research, you can attract a lot of different kinds of butterflies uh, to your backyard or, or mice. Um, particular ones I like is I like the pawpaw. The pawpaw tree, not only because it provides a lot of food, but it's a, it's a good larval host for zebra swallowtails. They also like shade. Passion flower, which has got a, a neat vine, and sometimes I'm able to get to the fruit when it's ripe and, and, and be able to eat that, but that gold, gold fritillaries, that's always a hard one for me, like to hatch out of there. You've got some of the violets, uh, that can also be a nice larval host. So making smart choices in the native plants you can have can bring a lot of different kinds of wildlife to your backyard, particularly when it, it's something is unusual some of the, these butterflies. When I was talking about habitat, you know, you talk about food, water, shelters, place to raise your young. Of course, anytime you add a water feature to your yard, whether it's, it is a pond or you have a stream nearby or even if you just put out a bowl of water and change it on a regular basis could be enough to, to, to keep a lot of wildlife in your yard now a lot of times people like to put up bird baths and that's a good thing but sometimes they might not get to use out of the bird bath as as we possibly can a lot of times when you see bird baths particularly in, in the store you'll see them on a pedestal well only a very few birds will actually use a bird bath when it's up on a pedestal if you were to set that bird bath bowl on the ground, you would have a lot more luck, particularly in the winter months. That's when the birds need it the most. And sometimes it's important to kind of even have a little bit of a heated water bath be able for them. But if you don't think you're going to be able to change that water and keep that water clean, um, and you don't want to necessarily mess with a pond, uh, one simple thing that you can do is you can attach a dripper, which you could buy almost any bird store or online, and just has a, you attach to your hose, and you turn your hose on just a little bit, and it just has a little drop of water that drops from the tip of it. And that little drop of water allows many birds to be able to bathe all year round, and that seems to be the more popular option. Also, it is a source of water for a lot of those birds, where they just don't want to get over-soaked by anything. 
And if you're looking at hummingbirds, my recommendation for there is you can turn on a simple sprinkler every so often, particularly during the hot part of the days around your feeders. And that will be enough for those hummingbirds to be able to get water, but also to bathe. Uh, or you can buy a specifically a mister that the hummingbirds even like even better. And that provides a lot of water sources for them as well. Another important water source that I really like to recommend are vernal pools, which are temporary pools or uh, small ponds that you could put in your yard. Um, not necessarily to put koi in or any of those kind of things, but to be able to provide a, a place for amphibians to raise their young, particularly some of the frogs. I like to hear the frogs here, particularly in the spring, but early in, uh, in spring or late in winter, you'll get another species that will use them and it can be quite critical. Kentucky and Tennessee have more types of salamanders and, uh, and newts in, in their borders than anywhere else in the world. And being able to provide them a source to raise their young can be quite crucial. So I'm gonna introduce you to one of them that we have. One of the most common salamanders that we have here in the state of Kentucky and Tennessee is the spotted salamander. These large salamanders, which have the big polka dots, are actually a poisonous salamander, which means if I stuck this in my mouth right now and I chewed on it, it would make me sick. It would make me nauseated. And there are some that are even quite more toxic than that. It is part of their defense mechanisms. And these little guys like to live in that loose litter, you know, from leaves and loose soil, and they hardly move from where they live most of the year. And they, what they're doing, they're eating worms or eating bugs or eating some of the, the isopods, maybe, maybe a centipede or two underneath there. And then every late winter or early spring, they'll go to your vernal pool and they'll lay big clumps of salamander eggs. And what's unique about these guys that they're finding out is that their salamander eggs actually get the baby salamanders that are in those eggs are have use photosynthesis just like a plant does. They have chlorophyll in them. And that chlorophyll provides a lot of food sources for those growing salamanders. And this is one of the first species they've actually found chlorophyll in the animal kingdom. So it's very unusual. But these guys are commonly found all throughout here. They're kind of fun to have around in our backyard. And they do provide a lot of ecological services in that they help control some of the insects. Can you guys see them? Kind of a cute little guy. Polka dots. Um, number eight. All right. Obviously, you know, there's some simple things in here that we can do. Um, chemicals can, can be quite necessary. I mean, we still have to use chemicals from time to time up here at the nature station to be able to control some of the, the stronger invasives or if we get behind. It, the matter is just in the reduction of it. Uh, some of the things you know, about using native wildflowers is kind of, and plants that makes it a little bit easier is they're a little bit more accustomed to the soil conditions that we have here in the state of Kentucky and Tennessee. So you don't need to use as much fertilizer. You don't need to use as much insecticide because they're accustomed to being um, dealing with some of the native insects. They, they, they're, they've adapted for that. So um, that's a benefit of those things. But one of the other things that we got to kind of be careful about it, when we use a lot of these chemicals, particularly some of the insecticides like the neonicotinoids that you might have heard about, is that the damage that it can do to some of the native bees, native pollinators, and the native butterflies. I mean, if it impacts one, if it impacts the roaches, it's going to impact the butterflies. So you got to be kind of careful about where you spray and how much you spray. Also, when it comes to fertilizer, if you do not need to use fertilizer, I would recommend not using it because often in a compacted soil, like say on the lawn, that fertilizer does not soak into the ground, but actually goes uh, with the big, large rains that we've been having lately, will go right into your stream and cause that filamentous green algae that we do not like to see in our ponds and our streams and our rivers. It makes it very hard for a lot of that wildlife, particularly fish, to be able to get oxygen in the streams. It makes it a very unhealthy system. So we've got to be kind of careful of the amount that we use uh, if we want to be able to encourage the wildlife that we have around us. Okay, nine. You know, this is the one that the more standard way that people understand uh, of tracking wildlife. And 
is building nest boxes. And this is more species specific, but it is critical. Things like a bluebird box, martin gourds, or a bat house can be a great way to attract the type of wildlife that you want to encourage in your backyard. I always like having a lot of bluebird boxes around, whether they are out in the open, where you will attract a bluebird, or in a forest environment where you'll get things more like titmice, white-breasted nuthatches, uh, chickadees, and flying squirrels. Uh, it's kind of the universal nest box that does a good job for about everybody. It also helps keep sparrows and starlings out as well. One of the most important things that you can do to encourage bats, and remember a bat can eat a thousand mosquitoes in an hour, uh, is by putting up bat boxes. Simple bat box designs are on the web, and if you put it up, it particularly at this time of year in April, right before they start showing up, which is right about now, they're gonna be here towards the end of the month. You can encourage a lot of bats in your yard if you face that bat box in an east-west direction, high above it, particularly if you have a water source nearby. Maybe you have a, um, a swimming pool, a cattle tank, um, a fish pond, anything like that will help encourage more of those bats to come to your yard and be able to provide ecological services by eating the insects that you have around you, as well as some of the ones that impede your gardens, like um, agricultural pests. And martins, you know, a lot of people think that the martins actually eat a lot of mosquitoes. Only 1% of purple martins, our largest swallow, will eat mosquitoes. They are daytime hunter. But one of the things that I like that they do for us is they eat a lot of flies. So a lot of those house flies, those stable flies, some of those flies that bite, horse flies, those are some of the big nuisance insects that those guys will help us eat. So I've got one last animal that I'm going to show you with this one. It is an animal that you can attract with uh, a nest box. And it's one I think you guys will enjoy. <laughs> oh. So I don't know if you guys can see him very well. But this is our little screech. His name is Carson. And Carson is one of the type of animals that will come to a nest box. Screech owl boxes are actually one of the best places to be able to draw these guys to your yard. These little mousers, these, little, these guys that eat moths. Uh, he only weighs about a quarter of a pound. The boxes are very generally simple to make. And you can use the box design also to attract other birds, but maybe in different locations. So this one box, nest box, should be placed deep in the woods, kind of in a place that maybe near a cedar tree where these guys might be able to hunt from. Uh, these guys got to watch out though because if you have barred owls or great horned owls in your neighborhood, they might not do as well. But if you plant the same type of nest box for a screech owl out in the open, say in an open field, you'll attract another one of these PB predators, which we call an American kestrel. It's a small prairie falcon that we have here in Kentucky. And both these little guys need as much help as they can, so nest boxes can be a very desirable way to do it. One of the things that I would caution you that you need to watch out for is that if you plant that nest box near the edge of a habitat, say where the woods end and the prairies end, you might get starlings in. The hole is large enough that a starling can live into it, so you do need to monitor, make sure that you're not encouraging these invasive species of birds to do that kind of damage. So he's kind of a cute little guy, isn't he? He got hit by a car and no longer can be released into wild, and that's why we have him here as one of our educational animals. And right now, he's sticking up his little feathers on top of his head. Those aren't his ears, they're just feathers, and they're trying to make himself look scary and intimidating to me. And it's working. I'm very scared of this tiny little fellow. Let me put Carson away, and we'll finish up the program. All right. The last of our 10 simple ways to attract wildlife is, is removing invasives. It's actually one of the tougher things that you can do uh, because invasive one, you gotta kind of understand what is invasive and invasives are hard to get rid of. We have been dealing with a, here at the Nature Station a lot of invasives that were brought here before uh, we were setting up the Nature Station's gardens or our prairies. Uh, they, a lot of times, sometimes invasives were thought to be as a good idea. You know, maybe they were planted here like autumn olive to attract wildlife. And later we found out that, oh, they're horrible. And maybe we just, just focus on the, uh, the natives. And that's, that is the general way that conservationists are doing now. Um, 
this is something that you would need to research. But the problem is, is that 30% of all the plants that you have in your backyard are going to be invasive, if not more. And these contain toxins that none of those caterpillars that we're talking about is so crucial for those birds are able to survive. To, for a chicken to be able to raise this young, 75% of the plants that you have in your yard have to be native. And what we're experiencing is a decline of the amount of wildlife that we have, not just you know, the, uh, some of the animals, but almost all the animals, particularly in birds. We don't notice it because it's a slow extinction. It's happening very gradually. And we may, you know, 10 years ago, we might've had 10 cardinals in our yard. Now we have two. Did you notice the difference? I don't know. But the more that these invasive species get in control of your yard, of your area, of your neighborhood, of your suburb, or your rural lot, the less wildlife we're able to have. And it, the easiest thing to do is to do some, just some simple research, contact your local nature centers, your state parks, be able to find out what invasive species that you have in your area. Some of the ones I have featured here are your Japanese privet. Very difficult for a lot of wildlife to be able to eat. I don't even think deer eat it. Japanese honeysuckle, it smells pretty. I really like it when it's in May and it's, it smells real pretty, but it, it only provides a little bit of shelter. It doesn't provide a lot of food. There are no hummingbirds can really use Japanese honeysuckle. And these are just a few of the species that you're going to find uh, that dominate our backyards. And so the more that you can reduce it, the more that you can encourage those native plants, the more wildlife you're going to have in your backyard. Now, the thing is, is this the end or is this just the beginning? I think if you take some of these simple steps and try to work towards it, you'll be very happy with the results and you'll be able to attract a lot more wildlife. I did a lot of these things to my own yard and during this time period of the quarantine, we were able to notice at least 63 different kinds of species of birds, about five different kinds of species of frogs. Uh, we, we had gray fox and red fox and groundhogs and, and deer and cottontail rabbits in our yard. So it, it does work. These methods are very true and they, and they can really help bring in a lot of wildlife to your yard. So I hope you guys get a chance to do that. I will recommend if you want to do some further research, of some really great books are written by a guy named Dr. Douglas Ptolemy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. And he wrote a very classic book called Bringing Nature Home. He also just wrote a new one called Nature's Best Hope that has a lot of these ideas that I've talked to you about in it. So if you want to learn a little bit more and some things that you can do in your yard, particularly the species of plants that are most beneficial for those caterpillars, thus the birds and the rest of the wildlife, then I would check out Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Ptolemy or Nature's Best Hope by the same author. I hope you guys enjoyed the program. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have them. in my backyard, but no bats ever congregate there. I see bats on my property all the time. What can I do to attract them to my bat house? The tree I am attached it to is right next to a creek that has lots of mosquitoes. It's about nine or ten feet up. Okay. It doesn't get any kind of uh, sunlight, uh, your bat box. Can you write back to Shannon on that? Does it have a east? Does it face east or west? It does get sunlight. Okay. One of the problems that sometimes bat houses uh, do, it does. It took us seven years for bats to be able to adopt our, our, our bat houses, so it can take some time. Um, each one is optimal, uh, depending on where you get it. The least optimal place to put a bat house is on a tree, uh, because a lot of times uh, it can be raided by raccoons which or snakes, which will take um, the bats a long time to either get it to come to it or they may adopt it and then they get taken out by the raccoons and stuff like that. We had one raccoon and one snake that came and raided our bat boxes and it took a long time for those guys to come back. Um, not to say that that's a particular issue or not, but I would recommend if you can put that bat box on maybe a post, maybe about 10 feet up in the air, facing east-west direction, uh, you do got all the right types of things. Sometimes it just takes a while. The other thing that could be a factor is that you may have lost a lot of the bats in your area due to white nose syndrome. You may have years ago have had a lot of bats in that area that were the appropriate ones, but now now it's harder. The population has has dropped quite a bit. Uh, 
The bats that you're seeing, there very well could be bats that don't sleep in bat houses, uh, particularly red bats. These are the ones that you can see in the, in the middle of January and February. They have long pointed wings. They have kind of a, a bright orangish color. They're big bats. Uh, another one is a big brown bat, which has more larger wings than a red bat, not less pointed. Um, they will go into bat boxes, but uh, there's only a few that will live in a bat box compared to your little brown bats that can be 100 at a time. Any other questions? I hope, that, I hope that answered it. Someone did ask if you could put a bat box on a pole next to a tree. Yes, you can do that. You want to make sure that that post, the pole is uh, all farther away from the tree so that a raccoon can't just jump over. Um, raccoons can be very damaging to, to bat colonies. Any other questions? Is my bat program on YouTube? <laughs> we, we did do a bat program earlier in uh, October. Uh, if you want more information about bats, uh, th that's a good subject that we can cover again. Um, you know, in, there's a number of resources out there, particularly Bat Conservation International. Uh, their batcon.org website is very good. And Merlin Tuttle, if you Google Merlin Tuttle, and uh, his bad organization, those are some good ones to get some good information too, as well as good designs. And then someone basically asked if they would have to just have a book on the top and they would take it. Okay, so there's no problem. Bird bass can be actually very valuable. Uh, someone asked about bird bass. A lot of times you'll see bird bass on, on a pedestal. And what scientists are finding is that only a few species of birds may use it when it's that high off the ground. If you set the bowl of the bird bath on the ground itself, um, it, you have a lot more success in attracting birds. Now, of course, you got to make sure that that bird bath is clean. Uh, bird baths tend to be used more in the winter. Uh, so you can just put fresh water out there. You know, our temperatures here don't get too po to the point that it freezes all the time. But you can purchase heated ones that just slightly heat it. Uh, if you don't want to do bird baths or, you know, you don't have to clean it all that often, uh, then I would recommend a dripper, which can be just as 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 powerful. And what you can do is you can buy that from a Wild Birds Unlimited or off of Amazon, or maybe even Lowe's sells some of these bird drippers. And that dripping water can provide a water source for the birds, as well as a place where they can bathe. We have one here, just incidentally, from a you know from a drain, and we see all sorts of different kinds of warblers and birds that will will sit down the, on the rocks underneath it and and bathe and and get drinks of water out there. Um, I would also recommend putting a piece of flagstone where the water can drip and maybe it, it puddles a little bit. That might also help uh, with the birds. All right, any other questions? Well, I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Once again, I do recommend uh, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Ptolemy. Uh, if you Google him and you, you like to listen to podcasts, he's on a number of different podcasts that you can hear him talk about many of the same things that I talked about. Uh, he's coming up with a lot of the research that uh, they're finding about attracting wildlife to your backyard, particularly uh, the idea that the best thing to do is to encourage the amount of caterpillars to grow in your yard to be able to attract more birds and make it a healthier uh, ecosystem in your backyard. Thank you for coming. I hope you have a good day and come see our gardens here at the Nature Station. We're very proud of them.